In fact, many rural areas have even higher rates of gun violence than the urban areas. Across the country, gun violence is a public health epidemic, plain and simple. In 2022, there were more than 48,000 firearm-related deaths in the United States. That's 132 Americans every day dying from gun violence. More than half of firearm-related deaths were suicides. More than four out of 10 were homicides. And guns are now the number one cause of death among America's children and teenagers. Not auto accidents, not cancer, guns. I'm gonna share a video that shows the devastation left in the wake of gun violence and provides a glimpse into heroic efforts to heal communities and prevent future violence. I'm going to warn the audience that the video is disturbing and may be upsetting to some if they wish to avert their eyes. Please play the video. Foundations, community organizations, and corporations have all stepped up to support initiatives that holistically address the root causes of this cycle of violence. I think reframing this as a public health crisis, you know, I'm an infectious disease specialist. Many of people in my field have actually turned to gun violence, recognizing that gun violence behaves like an infectious disease. It is contagious. Violence is passed on from person to person. Collecting data, identifying trends, developing strategies to prevent harm, reducing risk, sharing these practices, this is how you combat an epidemic. It's worked in the past. We use the same public health approach to dramatically cut automobile fatalities. We still drive where we need to go, but we have seat belts and speed limits that help us get there alive. Public health experts are already working to address gun violence in real time. Last year, Congress passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And I want to salute my colleague, Senator Cornyn, who is here with us today, uh, representing the minority. It took real courage, John. We may disagree on a lot of issues, but at a time uh, when we needed to act, you did your best, and I thank you for that. It included $250 million in funding for community violence intervention and $250 million for states to provide comprehensive community mental health services. Let me give one example of the successful, innovative programs underway. In Chicago, I heard from doctors personally who were sick of treating gunshot victims on the operating table. They wanted to prevent the gruesome injuries from happening in the first place. So in 2018, I brought together the CEOs of the 10 largest hospitals serving Chicago to understand what they were doing in the neighborhoods surrounding their hospitals and how we can do more. We formed the Chicago HEAL Initiative which has emerged as a national exemplar of how hospitals can collaborate and reach outside their walls to prevent gun violence. These hospitals have increased local hiring by 84% in the last four years. They've opened 24 school-based health clinics to serve 11,000 students and are training nearly 4,000 local students for careers in healthcare. Most importantly, these hospitals aren't just stitching up physical injuries. They're addressing the emotional scars of their patients. Through counseling and case management to prevent retaliation and promote successful recovery, just 2% of over 8,000 participating patients uh, in the, at the University of Chicago have returned to the hospital. Without these programs and this initiative, 45% of patients with a gunshot wound are likely to return within five years with another one. 
That is a stunning statistic. 45% within five years will return shot a second time. Similar steps are underway across the country to use this strategy, which is known as community violence intervention. CVI uses trusted community figures to engage with individuals at high risk of perpetrating or being victims of violence. They work to interrupt acts of violence before they happen and connect people with treatment and tools that decrease the risk of future violence. It's time for us to build on this bipartisan Safer Communities Act and ongoing efforts that are working in red and blue states. And join together, surely we can find some common ground between parties to create real change for the American people when it comes to this public health crisis of gun violence. I now turn to Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few months ago, the uh, Democratic governor of New Mexico, Michelle Lujan Grisham, issued a, quote, public health emergency order to suspend the right to bear arms in Albuquerque and surrounding Bernalillo County. I think I pronounced that correctly. She was warned repeatedly by officials in her state that uh, such a suspension violated the Constitution. A group of our colleagues here, including Senators Tillis, Graham, Kennedy, Blackburn, and Cotton, and I wrote to the Department of Justice to intervene and protect the constitutional rights of New Mexicans to carry a firearm outside of their home. Our request was consistent with the Second Amendment and the court's jurisprudence, and I expect that the court of last resort will find the same. But unfortunately, that doesn't mark the end of the road for this latest attack on what is a constitutional right. That's something our, some, of the, uh, some of our colleagues consist, consistently overlook. And the fact is that a firearm in the hands of a law-abiding citizen is not a threat to public safety. Indeed, there's a story, I think it's in the Washington Post today, by Philip Bump, who points out that 52% of American households have a firearm in that household, 52%. Washington Democrats have unfortunately chosen to follow Governor Grisham's lead and are now using public health as a guise to address their concerns. I wish they had the same concerns about the number one cause of death for Americans between the age of 18 and 45, which is fentanyl poisoning. Fentanyl made from pre chemical precursors from China going to Mexico, made to look like uh, relatively innocuous pharmaceuticals, which are then smuggled into the United States. And unfortunately, many young people end up consuming what they think is a relatively innocuous drug and die as a result of fentanyl poisoning. Well, we don't have to look far to see that examples of executive overreach um, that have relied on so-called public health emergencies. During the COVID-19 pandemic, too many politicians were quick to shut down houses of worship and church services while allowing other businesses and other organizations to operate. Here in Washington, D.C., for example, Mayor Muriel Bowser refused to allow the Capitol Hill Baptist Church to hold outdoor church services because of a public health emergency. The judge in that case found that the mayor had exceeded her authority and had substantially burdened the free exercise of religion. It's important to note that the application of these so-called public health precautions was not even-handed. While many politicians deemed it unsafe for businesses to operate or churchgoers to attend worship services, they seemed to have no problem with packed BLM riots, as in Black Lives Matter riots in the summer of 2020 that caused millions of dollars worth of damages. So we have a trust issue and a constitutional issue when we use the public health approach to attempt to strip away core constitutional rights. The other problem with the public health approach is that the most effective solution to firearm-related homicides and assault is effective criminal law enforcement. That means effective police, prosecutors, courts, and prisons. We know that these tools actually work, 
We know they work because we have historical data in order to prove it. As law enforcement efforts were stepped up in the early and mid-1990s, we saw dramatic declines in criminal violence of all kinds. One of the reasons for this is that the concentration of gun violence is among small numbers of the population. It's not the general population, it's a small percentage of the population where this phenomenon exists. In Washington, D.C., for example, in 2021, a study found that only 500 people were responsible for up to 70% of the gun violence in the district. In Boston, a 28-year-old study found that half of the city's homicides were committed by 1% of the population involved with gangs primarily. A 2014 study showed a similar situation in Chicago. What all of this means, I believe, is that if you empower law enforcement to selectively investigate and prosecute repeat offenders, you can dr dramatically reduce the gun violence in a community where it's a problem. By remo removing the worst criminal elements from the community, everyone is safer. That's the original purpose of the Project Safe Neighborhoods program, which passed out of the Senate this year. That program focuses on investigating and prosecuting the most dangerous and violent criminals in our communities to ensure they do not continue to harm other people. And we've seen over the last two plus decades, it's had an overwhelming success rate at reducing violent crime. Successful programs like Project Safe Neighborhoods require both resources and political will. You can't simply achieve safer communities by defunding the police or letting violent offenders out on bail like unfortunately too many, too many prosecutors have been willing to do in communities across our country. Today, violent crime is ravaging many of our communities and the public is of course taking notice as they must. Here in the District of Columbia, carjackings are up dramatically. And I have to believe that a lot of this has to do with the perception that there will not be consequences associated with committing such crimes against innocent citizens, including members of the United States Congress. A recent Gallup poll showed that 63% of Americans described the, gun, the crime problem in the US is either extremely serious or very serious. That's the highest level since this particular poll began in 2000. And 77% of Americans believe there is more crime today in the United States than there was just a year ago. Again, when we talk about the gun violence epidemic, it seems as though a substantial part of that debate is our current crime problem, which has spiked due to the left's soft on crime policies and the defund the police movement. Of course, we know the other side of the gun violence issue is mental health. This is especially important when we conclude, we include firearm-related suicides, as the chairman said. About 60% of the gun deaths in America are the result of a suicide, someone taking their own life. And of course, we know that the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which we did pass, made the single largest investment in community-based mental health care in American history a good start. In 2023, a survey from Mental Health America found that 21% of American adults have claimed symptoms of a mental illness. That's 50 million Americans. A 2015 study published by the Annals of Epidemiology found mental illness is strongly associated with increased risk of suicide, which accounts, as I said, for more than half of the gun-related deaths in, in this country. Suicide is a mental health problem, and we're not going to fix the issue by denying people their constitutional right to keep and bear arms, at least among the general population. Countries like Belgium, Japan, South Korea, all have higher suicide rates than the United States, but don't have a Second Amendment. Mental health problems are also often involved in mass shootings, as we know. In the wake of the Buffalo and Uvalde shootings, we looked at the profile of these mass shooters and found that many of them had serious underlying mental health problems, mental health issues that were unaddressed and untreated. Many of our colleagues, including Senator Tillis, 
Graham, Durbin, and Coons, and many others worked together, as you've heard, to pass the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. I think that bill has already saved lives. I get regular updates of the success of that law as, as it de deals with uh, mental health and violence in our communities, but there are other parts of the bill that are working as well. Since the law was enacted in G June of 2022, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, new criminal penalties and firearm trafficking had led to more than 100 new charges against dangerous cartel members and firearms traffickers. The enhanced juvenile records check alone has stopped 400 transactions of people who would ordinarily flunk a background check were they an adult and you only check their adult mental health and criminal history. But now because we have an enhanced check that includes juvenile records, 400 transactions have been stopped. While 98.5% of the background check system is unaffected. This, of course, builds on the positive changes that came from a bill we called Fix NICS, the National Instant Criminal Background Check Act, which was signed into law by President Trump in 2018. That law has led to the uploading of millions of new records into the FBI's National Instant Criminal Background Check database to prevent those who are already legally prohibited from possessing a firearm under existing law from obtaining one. All this was done both fix NICS and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act in a bipartisan way without infringing the rights of law-abiding citizens. The point is we can find ways to come together to get things done, but using public health authorities as a blanket excuse to strip away constitutional rights or framing, the gun, framing gun violence as an epidemic divides us more than it unites us, and it really kind of misses the point. These are not autonomously fired weapons. They involve human agency. And as we've seen, when we focus on the humans, we can have a very positive impact. So I hope we look at the entire picture of gun violence, which includes focusing on repetitive acts of violence by a small percentage of our communities, focusing on mental health um, diagnosis and treatment, and finding ways that we can address gun violence like we did in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Again, all without infringing on the rights of law-abiding citizens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. <clears throat> and uh, you've raised some very important issues like fentanyl, which we've had hearings in this committee about the issue of narcotics and what's happening to America. President Biden recently uh, raised this issue with the leader of China. I hope that it leads to something positive and diminishing the supply on that side of it. You raised the issues of uh, freedom of religion, which is important to all of us and is discussed frequently in this committee. Uh, you've talked about funding the police. I believe that funding the police is critical. Uh, I've never said otherwise. I hope that on some of the spending bills that our Republican friends will start voting for them when they find f uh, funding for the police included. Uh, that should be a bipartisan effort. But the one thing that you don't acknowledge and we disagree on is the fact that the United States of America is unique among nations. Unique among nations. There is no other country developed economy in this world where the number one cause of death among children and teenagers is guns period. We are a unique nation in many ways, but this is something we shouldn't take pride in. And to address it at this hearing, I think is appropriate and timely. The white coats that are represented in the audience here are men and women who have given their life to medicine and have to face the products of these violent actions and try to keep these poor people alive for another day. And yet we know that doing nothing means that 45% of them are going to return with another gunshot wound. What is wrong with this picture? Even if it is a limited number of people who are engaged in it, are we gonna turn our back on the fact that 122 Americans die every single day by gun wounds? That is a fact in our country and no other country. When it comes to mental illness, other countries face mental illness every day as well, but they don't turn to guns or wanton violence as an alternative in the way they do in the United States. That is entirely unique to our country. 
Before we return to our witnesses, let me briefly lay out the mechanics. After I swear the witnesses in, they'll have five minutes each to provide an opening statement and then a round of questions where each senator will have five minutes to ask. We welcome five witnesses and I'm going to introduce the majority witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Megan Ranney. Dr. Ranney is the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, board certified emergency physician and violence prevention researcher. She's been a leading national voice for addressing firearm energy injuries as public health problem for well over 10 years, thank you. We're joined as well by Dr. Franklin Cozy Gay. Dr. Cozy Gay is Director of Violence Recovery Program at the University of Chicago Medicine, which helps trauma patients and their families with crisis intervention and social service. In five years, the program has grown 800%, serving over 8,000 participants and employs more than 20 specialists who are themselves either gun violence survivors or family members of gun violence victims. Our final majority witness is Vaughn Bryant. Mr. Bryant is the Executive Director of Metropolitan Peace Initiatives, which is based in Chicago. MPI focuses on community violence intervention by providing trauma-informed behavioral health service, building a citywide network of outreach workers, and enhancing community capacity to reduce violence. I now turn the floor over to Senator Cornyn to introduce the minority witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Swerer, Amy Swerer is a, a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Her areas of scholarship include the Second Amendment, overcriminalization, school safety, and the intersection of mental health and gun violence. She runs Heritage's Defense Gun Use Database and is the primary author of Heritage's recent ebook, The Essential Second Amendment. She earned her JD and undergraduate degrees from the University of Nebraska. Mr. Stephen Cook, who's uh, been a frequent uh, witness here before the committee, served with the Department of Justice for 33 years, including 30 years as a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of Tennessee. Between 2017 and 2019, he served as Associate Deputy Attorney General and Director of Law Enforcement Affairs. In that capacity, he led two of DOJ's priority programs, violent crime reduction and strengthening the DOJ's relationship with state and local law enforcement. Before joining the DOJ, Mr. Cook worked as a police officer for seven years. Presently, Mr. Cook serves as a general counsel for both the major cities chiefs association and the major county sheriffs of America. And he also serves as outside counsel for the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I ask the witnesses to please stand and be sworn. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I help you, God. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Dr. Franklin Kozigay is first. Chairman Derman, Senator Cornyn, and respected committee members, I'm deeply grateful to have the opportunity today to share a personal story that underscores the vital violence recovery program. My name, Dr. Franklin Cozy Gay, the director of this hospital-based violence intervention program. As was highlighted today, gun violence is an agonizing crisis plaguing our nation, causing immeasurable pain and suffering. However, there are proactive ways we can respond to get in front of the problem and that through a collaborative and coordinated approach a public health prevention and intervention approach, many of our facets of our society can come together to be a part of the solution and hospital-based violence intervention programs are core to solving this complex puzzle. What is the Violence Recovery Program? It is a hospital-based violence intervention program that consists of highly trained paraprofessionals, many who are impacted themselves as survivors of violence, who often come from the community. They are housed in the hospital 24-7, 365 days a year. They provide crisis intervention support while the patient is there, and that continues through a coordinated approach with our spiritual care team, social work, child life specialists, mental health specialists, our clinicians in the hospital, as well as Healing Hurt People Chicago. Our specialists use intensive long-term case management, partnering with community violence interventionists in the community that have special relationships that are core to our approach for comprehensive recovery and preventing re-injury. Today, I wanna to bring the human side of our efforts through a story that has touched my heart and captured our collaborative and coordinated approach and why that approach is so critical. 
I want to share a story of a 12-year-old patient who arrived at our trauma center with a gunshot wound to the left thigh. At that moment, our team moved in swiftly in action within the hospital walls, not just as healthcare providers, but as compassionate individuals eager to make a difference. We provided practical assistance, providing a phone charger, a blanket, water, but we also consulted with our child life specialists to provide a comforting presence. As we delved deeper into the interpersonal risk assessments, it became painfully clear that this young child was exceptionally high risk for re-injury after being discharged. His family's safety was also in jeopardy. Through this juncture, it demanded more than just medical attention. We connected with shelters, securing temporary emergency funding resources to meet the family's immediate needs. Our support contended, continued understanding that we needed to provide wraparound services to address the holistic needs around resiliency and recovery from trauma. Our collaboration extended with our internal recovery and empowerment after community trauma, mental health clinicians who provided therapeutic sessions for our survivors and their families. We contacted our program partner, Healing Her People, who connected with patients within the trauma intervention specialists to provide this long-term case management. Regular calls, regular home visits were conducted with the patient and his mother, providing emotional, psychological support and with practical help such as emergency transportation, counseling, and community-based activities. I regret to share that that family's home was rattled with gun, gunshots. Their home was destroyed in a retaliation event. However, we secured transitional shelter in Indiana, our neighboring state, for 10 days. And after that, our team continued until we were able to establish a permanent home in a neighboring state. Collaborating with our street outreach partners um, that will be represented here by Mr. Bryant, we made sure that those leaders that have existing relationships with the individuals that are causing harm would agree to create a non-aggression agreement to prevent further violence from happening. That agreement has been, with, has been held up for this entire time. This example is underscored of, in regarding the complexity of the work that we're doing. One thing that I wanna highlight is the role that our Chicago Police Department have with our community violence interventionists. One of my proudest moments in doing this work is hearing our Chicago police officers commend CVI, community violence interventionists, for doing work, for establishing peace in the community and establishing non-aggression agreements. I'm equally proud when I hear our community violence interventionists commend the police officers for treating residents and those that are causing harm with respect and dignity. Since May 19, 2018, excuse me, the Violence Recovery Program has engaged over 9,000 patients. 85% of them have been African American, 70% of them have been victims of gunshot wounds, 81% males, 86 were involved in community violence, 60% between the ages of 22 and 40. Impressively, our program has accepted 89% of the patients have accepted services through this work, resulting in a re-injury rate of 2.1%. While this outcome speaks to their terrific work, re-injury rate is only at the program level. Thanks to Senator Durbin's HEAL initiative, we are working to establish data sharing agreements with all of the 10 hospitals that are a part of that initiative. As we continue to experience the impact of this gun violence, it is clear that this is a persistent public health crisis However, our response to be proactive needs to happen through a collaborative, a collaborative and coordinated approach. Hospital-based programs are very important, like our violence recovery program, to play a, a, a perfect role, a critical role in establishing solutions towards this complex puzzle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Stephen Cook. Good morning. Chairman uh, Durbin, Ranking Member Cornyn, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today. And thank you, Senator Cornyn, for that uh, introduction. I am serving in the capacities that you described, but I am here representing uh, views of, the views that I'm gonna express are the views of my own. Um, and I'd like to just begin with one single observation, and it's this. What this committee does or does not do will have a profound impact on violent crime in our country. I'm convinced of this because I was a federal prosecutor when our nation faced very similar problems in the mid-1980s. Crime was skyrocketing, Congress responded, 
and it responded with legislative programs and, and uh, statutes that allowed federal prosecutors to team up with their state and local law enforcement partners and to go after the most violent criminals in our country. The program worked. Violent crime began to turn around by 1991 as we continued to fill our prisons with violent offenders from across the country. By the, over the next two decades and by 2014, violent crime had been cut in half. Then in 2015, we began to see an, a rise and an increase in violent crime. To those of us who were participants in the system, this was no surprise because we had watched as the federal criminal justice system was incrementally weakened by events. This morning, I'd like to focus on four of those events. First, DOJ policy handcuffing federal prosecutors. Beginning with the Attorney General Holder's memo in 2010, and now followed up by Attorney General Garland's fed, um, memo to federal prosecutors, federal prosecutors have been ordered not to charge offenders, especially drug traffickers, with the most serious crimes they commit. As a result, the front end of our criminal justice system has been weakened. Second, in a series of opinions by the Supreme Court, significant, uh, the Supreme Court has significantly narrowed the reach of key statutory provisions designed to take violent offenders off the street. Among the statutes narrowed has been the Armed Career Criminal Act. Attempts have been made to pass legislation by Congress to correct these narrowing effects, but those, uh, those statutory provisions have not passed. Third, the steady drumbeat of anti-police rhetoric premised on baseless allegations that law enforcement officers across the country are racist. These are the men and women who are the backbone of our criminal justice system. Several studies have determined that the anti-police rhetoric has called, caused depolicing, which in turn has reduced arrests and undermined both federal and state criminal justice systems. The fourth item I'd like to address is the, is the finality of the federal criminal justice system and the fact that it has been completely gutted. The Sentencing Reform Act of 1984 uh, allowed uh, through a provision called the uh, most commonly known as the Compassionate Release Program, it authorized the Bureau of Prisons to file a motion with a sentencing court for a prisoner's early release for, and this language is important, extraordinary and compelling reasons. Typically, those motions were limited to acts such as, or incidents such as, where a prisoner had a fatal disease and the Bureau of Prisons filed for early release under those provisions about 24 times a year. In 2018, Congress changed the procedure, but not the applicable standard, by permitting defendants to file motions for compassionate release. Although the common uh, meaning of uh, extraordinary and compelling reasons, the statutory definition or the statutory language suggests a very narrow limited circumstances. The courts have taken a much broader approach and a much more expansive uh, view of their authority. By 2019, uh, between 2019 and today, they have granted thousands of early release motions. Recently, recently rele released statistics um, have shown that some inmates have filed numerous motions and collectively in one month alone filed 2,000 motions and in some months 20% of those motions were granted. And it gets worse. Uh, in April, the Sentencing Commission in a 4-3 to three vote promulgated uh, a further definition or a further reading of extraordinary and compelling grounds for early release. That broader definition included, among other things, allowing courts to consider changes in the law not made retroactive by Congress. Collectively, the actions by the Sentencing Commission and the expansive uh, court readings have resulted in a systemic structural change to our criminal justice system without congressional authorization or directive, and it has removed any finality in sentencing by allowing prisoners to file an unlimited number of motions relitigating their sentences endlessly. I see my time has expired. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Mr. Bryant. Uh, good morning, Chairman Derman, Senator Cornyn, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Vaughn Bryant. I'm an executive director of Metropolitan Peace Initiatives, also known as MPI, a division of Metropolitan Family Services. I come to this work growing up in Detroit, Michigan. I'm a, form, I'm a son of a 
Detroit police officer. And growing up, all of the sports I played were coached by police officers. Uh, I went on to become a fourth round draft pick by the Detroit Lions in 1994, and I've spent half of my professional career serving the community. MPI coordinates, supports, and sustains across agency community safety infrastructure made up of local community-based organizations rooted in neighborhoods hardest hit by gun violence in the city of Chicago. For the first time in Chicago's history, organizations with proven CVI outcomes across the city's geographies have come together to build a civilian infrastructure dedicated to preventing violence, delivering a comprehensive set of services to heal communities at highest risk for violence, and providing opportunities for individual rehabilitation. In 2015, Chicago endured the Laquan McDonald saga. In 2016, we saw 762 individuals killed by guns and 4,580 4, individuals shot, increases of 58 and 47 percent, respectively. That led to a group of local leaders establishing Communities Partner for Peace, or CP4P. Convened by MPI, we began to partner with eight organizations working in nine communities across the city of Chicago. Today, that coalition includes 13 partner agencies active in 27 Chicago communities. The program targets individuals most at risk for per perpetrating gun violence or becoming a victim. Key services include street outreach, engaging individuals at the high likelihood of shooting or being shot, case management services to address social de determinants of health, victim services to provide supports and safety planning for victims of gun violence, and community-based uh, events aimed at building community safety and solidarity known as Lightning and Night. We administer the Metropolitan Peace Academy, a multidisciplinary platform that trains, professionalizes, and strengthens the field of street outreach and community violence intervention. The MPA features a curriculum that is 18 weeks, 140 hours, 144 hours of intensive curriculum shaped and taught by street outreach workers, subject matter, subject matter experts, and is guided by 14 professional standards. MPI's model also includes behavioral health, workforce development, civil, civil legal aid, and organizational capacity building. In addition, MPI partners with Southland Resilience Initiative to strengthen and empower, other, always, also known as Southland Rise, a collaborative of the University of Chicago Medical, Medical Center and Advocate Christ Medical Center, formed in response to the Chicago Hill Initiative uh, launched by Senator Dick Durbin. It urges pro healthcare providers to bolster their efforts to reduce gun violence and address healthcare needs associated with violence recovery. Southland Rise was created to strengthen collaboration between hospitals and street outreach organizations with the goal of improving trauma-informed care and support for gun violence survivors and their families on the Chicago South Side and South Suburbs. The MPI, along with the two hospitals, together developed a two-day, of two four-day trainings, cross-trainings that began together, the, to brought together the perspectives and knowledge of both street outreach and hospital frontline staff. We completed our first cohort in June and began our next one in February 22. Since starting CP4P in 2017, members of organizations have provided over 200,000 200, direct service to direct services to 5,500 participants most acutely at risk of gun violence. Leading research by Northwestern's Center for Neighborhood Engaged Research and Science estimates that between July 2017 and December 2021, a time of rising crime in Chicago and the country, communities where CP4P was operating saw statistically significant and favorable changes of rates of homicide and nonviolent shootings compared to areas without CP4P. CP4P's work resulted in 383 fewer homicides and non-fatal shootings than would have been expected without CP4P. I want to go now to the, the, the importance of federal funding for this work. It has a national impact. Um, gun violence is a, is a national epidemic. We can address root causes uh, for systemic issues like poverty, inequity, and inequality, and lack of educational and, and employment opportunities. And giving a resource allocation can create standards of practice across this, the country that are important for this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bryan. Amy Swear. 
Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Cornyn, and distinguished senators. My name is Amy Swearer. I'm a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Ed Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Here we are, once again, holding a congressional hearing on gun violence. This time, the chosen lens is that of public health. Despite the slightly different title, it's effectively the same hearing as the last several gun hearings to which I've been called to testify. To be completely honest, I don't have much to say that's different from what I've said in my previous testimonies. I, believe me, I'm not being flippant. It's just that using a public health lens hasn't changed the discussion. Put aside that the end goal of many of those pushing the public health framing is often either to use crisis language as an end run around the Constitution or to pathologize the right to keep and bear arms. Put aside, too, that the public health lens is not particularly useful for understanding and addressing a problem that stems at its core not so much from a lack of insight into how violence affects health as from a lack of adequately enforcing criminal laws and utilizing existing mental health frameworks. If we take the issue of gun violence seriously from a public health perspective, none of the problems or solutions have changed. A public health framework doesn't change, for instance, the fact that most gun crimes are perpetrated not by ordinary lawful gun owners, but by a small subset of repeat offenders who are already prohibited from owning guns. It's still the case that if our policing, bail, and prosecutorial policies immediately spit these repeat violent offenders back into the community without pursuing criminal prosecution or punishment, they will predictably keep committing violent crimes. A public health lens doesn't change the fact that most gun deaths are suicides, but half of suicides are carried out with something other than a firearm. So pathologizing a specific weapon remains far less useful than talking about all lethal means during a personal crisis and dealing with hard underlying truths about the nationwide mental health crisis. It certainly doesn't change the fact that most of the gun control restrictions commonly proposed to deal with criminal violence and suicide, things like assault weapons bans, magazine capacity restrictions, punitive public carry laws, and so on, are not even remotely designed to meaningfully address any major factors underlying crime or suicide. And a public health lens doesn't fix the constitutional or practical concerns about implementing these policies, nor does it erase the fundamental importance of the right to keep and bear arms to the natural right of self-defense. And so my proposals for how Congress should move forward may sound pretty familiar. Among other things that I've outlined in my 35 pages of written submission, Congress can and should pursue the following. First, Congress can start right here in Washington, D.C., where the D.C. City Council's reform efforts have created a crime tsunami under which the district's residents are currently drowning. Congress should exercise its plenary authority and pass a modern, comprehensive criminal code for the district, including a mandatory sentencing scheme for the Superior Court judges. It should strip the D.C. Office of Attorney General of the authority to prosecute all crimes and give that to the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. It should federalize the D.C. Crime Lab and give that to the FBI. Second, Congress can and should rein in federal agencies like ATF when they shift their time and attention to over-regulating peaceable citizens instead of targeting violent criminals who actually threaten public safety. Third, Congress can compel the military branches to better share with civilian authorities all relevant information about service members who clearly pose a danger to themselves or their communities. Last month's shooting by a mentally ill Army reservist in Lewiston, Maine, was not the first time the military's failure to share, to share such information resulted in preventable tragedy. Congress can ensure that it is the last. Fourth, instead of spending so much time pathologizing and demonizing specific, specific mechanisms of violence, Congress can turn its attention toward promoting economic growth and easing crushing inflation rates. No, that's not nearly as sexy as calling for an assault weapons ban, but reducing economic stress, poverty, and family instability lowers a person's overall risk of suicide far more than requiring his or her rifle to be featureless. Senators, if today is an average day, by the time we finish this hearing in about three hours, roughly eight Americans will have been murdered, about twice as many will have killed themselves, and countless others will have been violently victimized. Much of that violence will involve firearms. This is antithetical to human flourishing, to the rule of law, and to civil society. It's a problem worth understanding accurately and addressing meaningfully. And so I am happy to come back and repeat the same testimony as many times as you ask me to. And I will explain the same potential courses of action as often as it takes for Congress to do not just something, but the right things. 
And I once again, look forward to your questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Swear. Dr. Branny. Chair Durbin, Senator Cornyn, and members of the committee, thank you for conducting this hearing and recognizing gun violence as a health crisis. I am a board-certified emergency physician and dean of the Yale School of Public Health. I've spent nearly 20 years working as an emergency physician in a top-tier trauma center. Here in the U.S., treating firearm injuries is a routine part of emergency medicine. During our training, we learn how to identify who must go right to an operating room, how to crack the chest of someone who's bleeding out, and how to notify family members of a death. While in training though, we rarely, if ever, learn to ask what could be done to prevent a gunshot wound in the first place. That changed for me about 15 years ago after I cared for a young man, the son of a first responder, who had shot himself with his parent's firearm. He was the first patient I'd cared for who had intentionally shot himself. I couldn't save him, but he changed my perspective on gun violence. First, his death drove me to learn more about firearm suicide, to realize that in the emergency department, we rarely saw suicide attempts from a gun, not because they were rare, but because they were so often fatal. Second, his death led me to question why we didn't think about gunshot wounds the same way we think about drunk driving or heart disease as something we can and should prevent. Most disturbingly, I noticed the difference in how my colleagues responded to this suicide compared to the everyday toll of community gun violence. Since that case, I have treated people for every type of firearm injury, from domestic violence to victims of drive-bys. I've saved some lives, but not all, and have informed countless families of the loss of their loved ones. And it is because I have had a front row seat to our nation's growing firearm injury epidemic that I have worked to define and implement a public health approach to this crisis. To clarify, this is how a public health approach works. First, we gather data on the problem. How common is it and who is affected? Second, we define risk and protective factors. What increases or decreases the chance of someone being hurt or dying? Third, we figure out programs that work to change those patterns, to avert injury, hospitalization, or death. And finally, we scale what works. We have example after example of how this four-step approach, when applied systematically, can improve human health without abrogating rights. For example, we car decreased car crash deaths, as Chairman Durbin mentioned, by more than 70% over the last few decades, despite more cars being on the road, by quantifying the problem, identifying risk factors, developing multifaceted solutions, ranging from reducing drunk driving to putting airbags in cars, and then by scaling what worked. Unfortunately, we have not yet consistently applied this approach to firearm injury. As a result, we are facing a growing epidemic. America's total number of gun deaths is the highest on record, and our rate nears its peak. Firearm deaths have surpassed breast cancer deaths in America. Firearms are now the leading cause of death for American children age one through 19. Although mass shootings get the most media attention, two thirds of firearm deaths are preventable suicides, averaged over the last decade, like that young man I cared for 15 years ago. The remainder are mostly community violence and to a lesser extent, domestic violence. Although there are clear risk factors and disparities, it is a problem that affects all of us. More than half of American adults say that they or a family member has been involved in a shooting. More than three quarters say the fear of gun violence has led them to change something in their lives. The effects of this epidemic are wide and long, ranging from immediate medical costs, estimated by the Government Accountability Office at a billion dollars a year, to long-term mental health, economic, and educational impacts. Mothers, fathers, friends, as well as first responders, all experience anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress after a nearby shooting. These dismal statistics aside, as an ER doc and public health dean, I have confidence we can turn the tide. Four things are needed to help us apply this public health approach successfully. Improved data, improved research funding, improved training of healthcare and public health professionals and community members to help us recognize and act on risk, and most of all, improved collaboration with the most affected communities, whether rural or urban. And this is where we need your help. First, help us get better data so Americans can better measure, predict, and evaluate this health crisis. You can make this happen, whether by funding data modernization for the CDC or by removing barriers to data sharing among state, territorial, and local partners, as Utah has done. Help us with federal funding for research to develop and evaluate solutions. 
At a minimum, continue current levels of appropriations for the NIH and CDC, but ideally appropriate more. Help us by supporting our scaling up and training of folks on things that do work. I'm happy to talk about this in Q&A. Or, and finally, help our country have hope by demonstrating collaborative action, as you have done before. We are turning into a nation of traumatized survivors, but I have story after story of public health collaborations between gun owners and non-gun owners, hospital workers and community violence interrupters, faith leaders and survivors. We have shown we can reduce the risk of a shooting long before someone picks up a gun with intent to harm. Through your bipartisan commitment to this public health approach, our country can reduce firearm injury and death for all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranney. I'm gonna start with uh, five minutes of questions and then turn over to my colleagues, each having the same opportunity. I listened to those who are critical of our even having this hearing and talking about this. There's so many more important things we can talk about. And yet, I just wonder if there's anything more important than life or death in your average neighborhood. Is there anything more important than knowing that that little boy or little girl that you sent to school this morning is safe in the classroom? doesn't have to hide under his desk, active shooter uh, drills and exercises. You know, that really gets down to the basics. If you wanna know about the safety of your family, it starts with the knowledge that when that child goes to school, he's gonna come home safe at the end of the day. If you can't answer that question affirmatively, what, are the, what in the hell are the rest of the questions worth? This, to me, is a fundamental issue, and it is a public health issue. It involves not hairstyles, it involves death death by gunshot, and it's going on in America every single damn day. And we have a responsibility to do something up here, not just to say we need to fund the police more, I'll sign up for that. We need to deal with mental health counseling, I'll sign up for that as well. But are we gonna do some basic things like safety locks on guns so the kids can't play with them? Are we gonna do anything basic uh, like uh, identifying people who should not even be considered owners of guns and have take advantage of the gun shot, uh, the gun store loophole. Uh, that to me is an example of what we can do that is just common sense. Some states have taken a lead on this and some may be surprising. Is there any restriction on buying a gun in the state of Wyoming, one of the most Republican states in the United States? Yes, turns out they have a state law that says you have to be 21 years of age. We're still debating this on a national basis. Even a conservative Republican state like Wyoming thinks that makes common sense. I agree with them. I wanna ask a question. I have so many I can ask, but of uh, Dr. Uh, Coney Gay and Mr. Bryan. And it really gets down to an experience I had thanks to Children's Memorial Hospital, uh, Lurie Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. They gathered some gunshot victims together and I met with them in private and said to them, okay, close the doors, this is off the record. What is it this old white guy ought to know about what's really happening in the streets of Chicago? Finally, when they loosened up and started giving me a response, it was a great day in my life. I learned a lot in a very short period of time. I'll never forget two who talked about the homes they grew up in. One young man, African American man said, Senator, I grew up in a house with no rules. When I woke up this morning and opened my eyes, I decided what time I'd get out of bed and whether I'd go to school. I decided whether I'd stay out on the streets all day and all night. I decided whether I'd buy drugs or guns. That was my decision. There were no rules in my house. I contrasted that with my own life. From the minute I opened my eyes in the morning until I closed them at night, there were rules flying at me in every direction. Get up, make your bed, brush your teeth, make your lunch, take care of your little sister. Make sure that we have the dog out for a walk. And when you get to school, there's a nun waiting there with a hundred more rules. And, <laughs> and the penalty is to burn in hell if you didn't follow them. What a contrast in formative years. The second thing was a young woman who said, I'm, I was a mother, she was probably in her 20s. She said, I was a mother at the age of 14. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. I said, why? She said, my mother was a junkie. She brought boyfriends home, took advantage of her, and then turned to me. Finally, with that baby, I got out of that house and had a chance. I made something of my life as a result. Those are contrasting life experiences, which I don't know personally, but are part of this calculation. So let me ask the two of you, can we reach young people who have gone through those traumatic experiences and turn their lives around from violence? Doctor? 
Thank you, Senator Durbin. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing the story. And um, there's a phrase that I like to use that's connected to individuals that have lived similar lives, is that no one person should be judged by the worst thing that they've done in their lives. The work that we use focusing on individuals that are survivors of violence that have actually caused harm themselves, either in the hospital or in the community-based side, these are individuals that have desisted from that, but they've learned from that. They understand the impact that trauma has. That mom that was a junkie, there's a reason why that mom was a junkie. What the role that trauma has on the household um, impacts parental practices, monitoring um, how parents and families monitor their children. We need to uplift the role that trauma plays in our society. I believe in this room we both agree that the impact that trauma has in terms of suicide rates, we take that same frame, we humanize, but we understand that the individuals that are should be trusted to intervene are individuals that have led that life themselves and they're asking individuals to walk on the same path that they've, they've walked on because they understand that path. When it comes to addressing issues connected to trauma, you have to really understand the role of trust. A lot of our systems, over time, trust has been eroded. And so having individuals that understand that life is a, an important first step. Thank you. Mr. Bryant, you've got 30 seconds. Yes, I, I would agree. I would add not only people with the lived experience, but also trained experts in mental health paired with those folks uh, to work to heal our communities. The, the average age of the, the folks that we work with is about 31. So imagine a 31-year-old black male who hasn't finished high school, never had a formal job, you know, a lot of times they've grown up, you know, similarly with no rules. And if we can get to those people and help heal those people, then they're going to be not only better for their communities, but they're going to be better for their families because typically they're going to have kids as well. And a lot of the times that when we see youth getting shot, it's related to an adult in their lives that is living a life that, you know, is not necessarily dignified. And all of our work is really around engaging, healing, and help putting people on a path to living a dignified life. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Senator Cornyn. The longer I've been in uh, Washington, D.C. and worked in the United States Congress, the more I have come to believe that uh, what divides us is not our goals so much as the means to achieve our goals. And here, obviously, we all would want to, to diminish and reduce um, violence in our communities. Mr. Cook, the years ago there was a project exile in Richmond, Virginia, I guess was the first place that a concentrated effort between federal, state, and local law enforcement efforts to focus on essentially repeat criminals, felons, possessing firearms, using firearms, committing other offenses to target that aspect of violence in our communities. That's now become uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods, which I mentioned has passed the Senate earlier this year. Given your experience as a federal prosecutor, um, can you describe the importance of focusing our, our time and resources on those, that uh, small microcosm, really, of our communities that are committing most of the violent acts using firearms in our communities? Yes, sir, I can. Let me first begin by thanking you for championing the Project Safe Neighborhoods reauthorization and to the members of this committee who voted for that. Project Na Safe Neighborhoods, which was a spinoff from the wildly successful exile project in Richmond, um, has, has it, it's, that project itself has continued with the cornerstone being exactly what you said, and that is to take uh, partnerships with federal prosecutors, state and local law enforcement, take those partnerships, identify the worst of the worst, and put them in federal, federal prison. But Project Safe Neighborhoods really is more comprehensive than that. It also has other components. In our district, it was very successful. We had a 23% reduction in the first uh, four years of the project. But it was more than just putting people in prison. That was the cornerstone. But we also had a reentry program. We also had an educational component. We also had a community interface component. So Project Safe Neighborhoods has continued to, to, to produce uh, great results across the country, varying as, as high as 41% reductions in violent crime. In addition to reauthorizing Project Safe Neighborhoods, uh, what, in your opinion, what else 
should Congress be focusing on to make sure that we're dealing with this identifiable recalcitrant uh, criminal element that are responsible for most of the violent crimes in our communities? Federal prosecutors need the tools back that, that, that I mentioned that have been taken away. First of all, as I said, finality in the federal criminal justice system has been gutted, and it's been gutted because the courts and the Sentencing Commission have taken the authority that Congress has given it through 3582, and they have run with it. And uh, I think they've out, far outstripped the authority that Congress intended. So first, I, th I would suggest that Congress put guardrails on 3582, serious guardrails. Secondly, I think that, that Congress needs to look at the Armed Career Criminal Act and the related statutes and make amendments that, uh, that, that correct the narrowing that the Supreme Court has taken over the years because those tools are fundamental to our ability to put those trigger pullers, those violent criminals who are the, the key to reducing violent crime, it's, those are the tools we need to put them in prison and keep them there. Dr. Rainey, the, um, I applaud the uh, efforts that you're undertaking. I, as you've heard, I have some questions about framing this as a public health crisis, but uh, we'll leave that for a discussion at another time. Let me ask you, in 2022, you gave in, you uh, did an interview with the American Medical Association where you said that mental illness is not a predictor of hurting others. Hatred is. Would you apply that to violent street gangs that are competing for territory and profits uh, in communities across the country? Do you think it's hatred or do you think it's something else? Thank you, Senator Cornyn, and thank you again for your leadership with Senator Murphy on the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. As I outline in my written testimony, studies have shown that people with serious mental illness are more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators of violence. Substance use and antisocial personality disorder are risk factors for being perpetrators of violence. Um, and of course, as you outlined, mental illness is deeply connected to firearm suicide, which is the leading type of suicide, of uh, excuse me, of firearm death in this country. Do you, in your experience, do people suffering mental health crises tend to self, uh, frequently self-medicate, which exacerbates their dangerousness to themselves and others? That can happen if there's inadequate access to mental health treatment. I think it is worth noting that uh, when you actually look at mass shooters, the vast majority of them were in an identifiable crisis prior to that mass shooting, but only slightly more than the average American pop population uh, have been identified as having serious mental illness. An awful lot of them are suicidal. And so there is an element of getting folks treatment and uh, access to care, it's also about limiting access to lethal means uh, at that moment of a crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the chairman and uh, ranking member for having this hearing. Uh, it may seem repetitive, but we need to continue this work because we face a public health crisis that is only expanding as you have demonstrated and we all know simply measured in deaths and injuries. Uh, I've been working on it since the early 1990s when I first became Attorney General of the State of Connecticut and we advocated then for an assault weapon ban which was passed, was challenged in court, I defended it as Attorney General and we have expanded in Connecticut on the types of gun violence prevention laws that we have showing that these laws actually work. They've reduced deaths and injuries, assault weapon ban, background check, Ethan's law, providing for safe storage, and uh, other kinds of measures like the red flag statute, Connecticut was the first in the nation to adopt it. So if we, had, if we take the public health approach that Dr. Rengi has advocated. And we are data-driven as the medical professionals in this room wearing the white coats use every day, respecting facts, making decisions based on science. I think that 
we will continue to build on the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which we passed and showed that we can defeat the gun lobby. That the NRA and its allies are not implacable, invulnerable foes. Dr. Rainey, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the importance of violent crime as an indicator of potential additional gun violence. I'm struck by the statistic that 41% of patients treated for violent injury are re-injured within five years. In other words, there is a cycle here. There is a repetitive phenomenon. I think we can and we should ensure that more victims of violent crimes do not become repeat victims. And the Yale New Haven Hospital's violence intervention program has been very effective in a number of ways in preventing uh, the, the kinds of repeat injury after trauma. Uh, in your firsthand experience, can you describe for us how these programs work in practice and how maybe we can have some common ground here in supporting violence intervention programs like the one that Yale New Haven has in practice right now? We're tremendously grateful for the Yale New Haven Health Violence Intervention Program, which was started in 2020. I also sit on the board of the Nonviolence Institute in Providence, Rhode Island, um, and have worked closely with folks in Chicago and elsewhere in community violence intervention programs. These are some of the programs with growing data behind them. Um, I'll particularly highlight the CRED program uh, led by former Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan in Chicago. Um, they provide life skills training and mental health support as well as community mentorship and rigorous research has shown that that program correlates with decreased arrests for violent crime as well as decreased likelihood of participants being shot. Similar statistics are available from programs in Missouri, um, from programs in DC, and from elsewhere across the country. Uh, again, because of those limitations on the public health approach, which I outlined at the beginning, we do can still have limited data on how effective they are. We don't have those formal randomized controlled trials, but this combination of providing a caseworker, mental health support and substance use treatment when needed, and helping get folks into safe housing, um, help them get an education, has a demonstrated effect on both future injury, but also long-term life success. I was very moved by your description and your testimony of the suicide uh, <coughs> victim that you tried to save, one of your first cases involving suicide by the use of firearms. Uh, there are loaded and unlocked guns in the homes of 4.6 million American children, like the son of that law enforcement officer you described. I've been an advocate of Ethan's law passed in the Connecticut legislature and introduced it here in Congress along with Representative Rosa DeLauro on the House side, which would prohibit unsecured storage of firearms. Could you speak to how secured storage helps reduce suicides or other supposedly accidental shootings? Absolutely. So the majority of youth suicides and school shootings perpetrated by youth, including an article that actually just came out today in JAMA, are committed with a family member's firearm. Um, obviously, youth can't legally purchase firearms, um, and so they find a parent's firearm, which many of us think is stored safely, but when you actually ask kids, they all know where their parent has stored their firearm, the same way that our kids all know where their birthday presents are stored. And studies have shown that they actually can access it quite quickly. Um, states that have put safe storage laws in place see a 20 to 25% decrease in child firearm fatalities. But I will emphasize that the legislation alone is not enough. It needs to be matched with community engagement, um, with enforcement, with education. Um, many of the firearm groups that I work with are tremendous advocates for safer storage of firearms. Um, and there are ways to do this again without abrogating gun owners' rights. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Grassley. Ms. Schwer, uh, in February, I reintroduced uh, a bill that I call the Eagles Act, focusing on using behavioral threat assessment model to identify individuals showing pre-attack behavior and manage the threat to prevent targeted violence. How does behavioral threat assessment model prevent 
gun violence, if you think it does, and is this something worth expanding? Sure. Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. I, I think when we're talking about behavioral threat assessment, the most often aspect in which it comes up is preventing, like you said, targeted acts of specifically mass violence. And I think it can be incredibly useful in that capacity. As, as Dr. Rainey mentioned, um, a, a lot of these uh, perpetrators of, of mass violence, while they may not be diagnosably seriously mentally ill, a lot of them are in some sort of crisis. Most often it is noticeable in the weeks, sometimes months and years leading up to that that incident. It's it's uh, fairly rare that you you have a perpetrator of mass violence who, um, it, when all is said and done, people turn around and say, oh, we, we never saw that coming. Most of the time um, it, is, it is fairly identifiable beforehand. And so that training in, in professional threat assessment, helping people identify those factors and then knowing what to do about those factors, how to assess them um, and what proper steps to take, that's all very important when we're talking uh, specifically about targeted violence, but also there's a, a lot um, that we can do with that in, in terms of suicide as well, um, because a, a lot of people who are suicidal, again, that is is noticeable, that, that, that lead up to crisis is noticeable. Um, and so it allows us to intervene before we reach that crisis point or before that crisis point becomes um, violent or fatal. Again, for you, um, going to the problems we've talked about here in Washington, D.C., the average homicide suspect has been arrested 11 times prior to their committing a homicide. Uh, homicide. What role do progressive prosecutors who refuse to charge gun offenses and other violent crimes committed by criminals play in gun violence epidemic? Yeah, so I, I will note that my colleagues, uh, Coley Simpson and Zach Smith, have written extensively on this issue as well. Um, again, when, when we're talking about this small subset of repeat offenders who are overwhelmingly responsible, either directly or indirectly, for facilitating that crime, um, when you just release them back into their communities without prosecution, without any sort of um, de detaining of them, you're releasing them to continue committing the exact same crimes over and over. And in some cases, it actually emboldens them because now they realize, well, I can probably get away with this. Statistically, even if I am arrested, I'm not gonna be prosecuted. And if I am prosecuted, they're gonna let me right back out. Um, that's not deterrence at all. There is no deterrence factor. Um, we are essentially eliminating um, any perceived reason for criminals to stop committing criminal actions. Again, for you, in August, the Justice Department issued a proposed rule that would increase the number of folks who have to register for federal firearm license in order to uh, do business that way. Uh, the rule says, quote, even a single firearm transaction or offer to engage in a transaction when combined with other evidence may be sufficient to require a license, end of quote. In April, Director Dettelbach told the House Judiciary Committee that when ATF writes its proposed rule, it, quote, looks at the law that Congress passes and the public safety threat to America, end of quote. In your opinion, does this new rule apply to the law as written by Congress? And if not, uh, explain why you feel that way. Uh Thank you, Senator. And no, I think anytime you have a very slight wording change and the proposed regulations are essentially 108 pages explaining how it, it was sort of a way more significant, it, that should be a red flag uh, immediately that it's not actually consistent with the change in the law. Um, I think most concerning are, are some of the sort of presumptions that ATF um, wants to now write in to, to say, look, if you do X, Y, and Z, it's presumed you needed an FFL even if you did it once, um, because it includes things like in selling the firearm with the original manufacturer's packaging. That packaging includes things that are essential for gun safety, including the user's manual and the original trigger locks that had to have been sold with it. To say that selling those items now means that you are suddenly an FFL when you would not have otherwise been disincentivizes uh, private unlicensed individuals from including that important safety. So when, when we're looking at that sort of uh, absurdity, we have a problem with the law, even above and beyond, do I think it reflects the federal statute? And I don't think it does. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Rono.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that um, uh, I heard my colleague, Senator Cornish, say that we have a shared goal. And I would say that our shared goal is to decrease gun violence in our country, our, the number one killer of young people in our country. And how do we do that? One of the ways is to, I, I, I suppose, uh, lock up the violent criminals, although uh, I'm not so sure that that's what we're doing, that our, our prisons are populated, uh, have been populated for a long time with maybe not, not violent, uh, nonviolent um, drug cases, be that as it may. For Dr. Raymond, you've worked in this area. Is, are there other things that Congress can do to decrease the um, easy access to guns, which results in uh, the deaths of our young people? Uh, one of the biggest things, which I know is uh, partly addressed in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, is around domestic violence um, and domestic violence restraining orders. Um, mm -hmm. We know that if a perpetrator of domestic violence has access to a gun, you see a 500% increase in the risk of the victim being um, uh, 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 killed by that gun. Um, we know that most murder-suicides are partner violence, um, most mass shootings are domestic violence related, and domestic violence is a leading cause of pregnancy death. Um, we also know that states with limits on uh, firearm access by people under a domestic violence restraining order have a significant decrease in firearm partner violence. So that's a significant thing that Congress can do. Extreme risk protection orders or red flag laws um, are also, the data suggests, tremendously effective in decreasing suicide death in particular, and there's some anecdotal evidence that they may help in reducing mass shooting deaths. Um, and then lastly, of course, data and accurate assessments of whether or not these things work matter deeply. The American public deserves us to spend money and legislation on programs that work, and uh, funding both data and research helps with that enterprise. Thank you for noting that domestic violence uh, situations are among the, uh, the worst uh, things leading to gun violence, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Fifth Circuit case uh, based on Bruin, where uh, in a domestic violence situation, the Fifth Circuit tossed out the, um, the, the use of a gun because of a person who was under a domestic violence uh, um, um, order, I think. Anyway, the, this case is before the Supreme Court. What are your concerns about if the court su sustains the uh, Fifth Circuit in terms of the ability of of the federal government or anybody else to to limit gun uh, accessibility uh, from people who have domestic violence uh, orders. So I, there's two sides to this. One is the personal. I've taken care of um, multiple victims of domestic violence shootings, and they are like those firearm suicides, just horrifying. Mm -hmm. um, they almost never come out of the blue. Uh, folks know before they happen that they are at risk. Um, I lost a colleague, a fellow emergency physician in 2018, who was shot and killed as she worked out, walked out of a shift uh, at a Chicago hospital um, by her ex-fiance. So this is something that has tremendous personal resonance um, to me. The other side of it is, is that domestic violence is one of those very well-established risk factors for violence against self and others. Again, not just against the partner, but also against children, family members, and society at large. And so there is tremendous concern on the part of the health and public health community that should um, that Rahimi case uh, be decided to overturn um, the, the prohibitions on, on firearm ownership by folks with a history of conviction of domestic violence, that it will have tremendous negative downstream effects um, for uh, Americans in general, in terms of the, the number and severity of firearm injuries. And you are referring to the Romina case, which is before the Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, thank you for making the connection between domestic violence situations and gun violence. But the Bruin decision is leading to uh, unexpected consequences, I would say. And in, in, in many criminal proceedings, the, uh, the criminals or the, the people who are being um, tried are using the Bruin decision for the proposition that they cannot be prevented from owning a gun. So the Bruin decision is going to continue to create a, a, a lot of, of questions. In fact, in Hawaii, for example, we have some of the strictest gun laws, and many of these laws are being challenged under the Bruin decision. So I think that uh, 
This is the Bruin decision is one that I think Congress could, should look at. I realize that the uh, that decision is based on a constitutional uh, right to bear arms, but it is not an unfettered right, and I think that there is probably more that we can do to uh, uh, limit the the uh, impact of the Bruin decision. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Rainey, um, welcome first. Uh, you, you are an ER doc, is that right? Okay. Correct. And I um, understand you've been on television a lot? A fair amount. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I understand you, you built a, uh, a home television studio, is that right? That's a bit of an exaggeration. I had a laptop on a, uh, on a stool. <laughs> your, your husband didn't build you a home studio? He did not build me a home studio, no. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Why do you think that Chicago has become America's largest outdoor shooting range? Do you think it's because of Chicago citizens uh, who have no criminal record, but, but who have a, a awfully a gun in their home for protection or perhaps for hunting? Or do you think it's because of a finite group of criminals who have rap sheets as long as King Kong's arm? So Mississippi, Louisiana, and Missouri actually have higher firearm death rates. Um, obviously, there's certain... What about Chicago? So I don't live in Chicago. It's not my primary area of research. You don't have an opinion on that? I think there's easy access to firearms compared with, combined with environmental conditions, uh, lack of great education. There have actually been studies showing that when you green vacant lots and repair abandoned buildings in urban neighborhoods, you see decreases in gunshots, in violence, as well as in stress and depression in the neighborhoods around them. That, no disrespect, Doc, but that sounds a lot like word salad to me. Let me ask you this. Um, in, in September of um, this year, our New Mexico governor issued a public health emergency order, and, and she, she suspended the right to bear arms in Albuquerque and the surrounding county. Do you support that? I, I do not. What I do support is the work that New Mexico yeah, has done do you with- you support that? No. You don't? Okay. Um, let's see. During his first two years as uh, the DA in Philadelphia, District Attorney Krasner, Krasner and Loster dropped 47% of all the illegal firearms cases in the city. You agree with that? I'm not a lawyer, I'm a physician and a public health professional. I can say that New Mexico has done amazing work in trying to I'm address the suicide about, and partner I'm violence. I'm asking about Philadelphia. I don't the, have the an DA opinion. The DA dropped 47% of all the illegal firearms cases. Did he do the right thing there? I don't have an opinion. However, I will say that just as with fentanyl, the all spread right. of illicit substances. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm that's running okay. out of time. Understood. The, the L.A. District Attorney, uh, George Gasson, Gasson, said that he would not prosecute any uh, sentencing enhancements for guns or gun gang-related activity. Do you, do you think he did the right thing? Again, I am neither a lawyer nor a prosecutor. You don't have an opinion on that? I, I honestly don't know enough about it to have an opinion. You, you don't think gangs should be uh, prosecuted for having gu illegal guns? I'm neither a lawyer nor a prosecutor, and I don't. That's not my area of research. But yet, you want to take guns away? I've never from, said that I want to from, take from guns from away. From law-abiding citizens. Mm. I, I think that you are saying something that I've not said in my written or oral testimony, sir. Okay. Um, you, you equated gun deaths to heart disease in your opening statement. Yes, sir. Which is a greater public health problem? Gun deaths or heart disease? 
So heart disease does kill more folks across the United States, largely in the about end of their life. About 700,000? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gun deaths, about 50,000? Correct. Do you, do you support outlawing fried foods? I, I'm sorry. How does that relate to... Because fried foods contribute to heart disease, don't they? Again, I have not written or said that I I'm support sure, outlawing... You're a physician, right? I am. Have I said that I support outlawing anything in my testimony today? Okay. Um... Let me ask one more question. I'm sorry, I cannot see that far, doctor, on the very end. Cozy Gay, thank you. Yes, sir. You, you said, I wrote it down. You said that no one should be judged by the worst thing they have done in their lives. Correct. If one of these young doctors sitting behind you, God forbid, walks out on the streets of Washington, D.C., and is raped or sodomized, you don't think the rapist should be judged? I don't think it should be terminal. It shouldn't be for the rest of their lives. You think we should forgive them and not give them any punishment? I believe in you forgiveness. You think nobody's responsible for their actions? I believe in responsibility. I believe in forgiveness. Thank you, Mr. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Butler. Thank you, Chair Durbin, Ranking Member Cornyn, for convening the committee uh, on such an incredibly important topic. I want to also appreciate our witnesses uh, for joining us uh, today, offering such incredible testimony. Ms. Most importantly, Mr. Chair, I'd like to appreciate the physicians uh, and clinicians who've joined us uh, today for their dedication uh, in helping us to protect uh, our members of our community uh, and also for your dedication in helping our country um, combat this important crisis. Mr. Chair, I agree with the words that you offered. Uh, this is a conversation that is about our children. It's a conversation that, in my opinion, is very much about the future of our democracy. Dr. Rainey, I'd like to direct my first question to you. For decades, Congress has refused to allow CDC uh, to use federal dollars to research uh, gun violence prevention. Finally, in December 2019, Congress passed the gun violence Prevention Research Act, which granted $25 million uh, per year to the CDC and then and the National Institute on Health to study gun violence prevention from 2020 to 2022. For those who feel like they know everything and that we keep having the same conversation, Dr. Rainey, can you tell us what this money has been used to help us learn and what more do we still have uh, to uh, understand relative to gun violence prevention. So it, that money is currently being used to study things such as projects working with the National Guard to try to decrease firearm suicide through lethal means counseling, uh, projects working with families to improve safe storage of firearms um, when someone has dementia to reduce the chance of uh, intentional or unintentional injury or death. Uh, it's being used for projects to describe risk factors, um, to evaluate programs like uh, the one that I mentioned around putting gardens in vacant lots, which has shown to decrease gun violence in surrounding neighborhoods, to see can we expand that work. Um, there are projects uh, that are being, I mean, I could, I could go on. It's, it's a whole bunch of things like that where we try to identify what are the patterns of injury how do we identify risk and protective factors? And then how do we intervene? Again, in the same way that we intervene for heart disease. Maybe there are medications, maybe there are counseling efforts like teaching people about obesity um, or smoking. Um, and then potentially there may be legislation, um, but legislation alone is never sufficient. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vaughn um, Bryant, I'd love to now turn my next question to you. Um, in a related topic, um, brought by Senator Hirono. Um, gun violence um, really does sit at the intersection of another public health crisis, that being uh, intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, in the United States, approximately one in five women and one in seven men have experienced severe physical violence by an intimate partner. On average, three women in this country are killed each day by a current or former intimate partner. When an abusive intimate partner has access to a firearm, that victim is five times more likely to be killed, as has been noted. My question to you is based on your community violence approach, um, prevention uh, approach. Um, have you seen and um, uh, and have you what have, what has been the impact of um, your particular approach, the, the pr approach that your organization offers, as it relates to intimate partner violence? So we would say that um, interpersonal conflict in general is one of the you know uh, precepts to gun violence, and oftentimes. Um, is either intimate partner violence or conflict between intimate partners in general often leads to a, a larger conflict, which also leads to death. So for us, we have partnered with local uh, domestic violence organizations to learn more about uh, intimate partner violence. All of our clinicians are trained in domestic violence as well so that their understanding of that as they work with the people that we're really trying to seek. And you know, we will on, on an ongoing basis continue to strengthen that relationship so that we're aware, but that we're also teaching um, our domestic partner uh, um, partners, domestic violence partners, about our work, so that we can continue to, to strengthen what we know is a precipitant to, to gun violence. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you very much, Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to say thank you to each of you for being here today for your thoughtful answers. And I think, Mr. Chairman, we can all say we want to make certain that um, children are safe when they go to school. And I want to start with that. Ms. Ware, let me come to you. I, um, I'm a mom. I'm a grandmom. I've spent so much of my work on making certain that we protect children and that they have an environment where they can learn, whether it's there at school or in community activities. And I think we all know that there are violent criminals that um, are in our communities, and we know that our schools need training, and uh, they need security tools to keep children safe. And that's why I introduced the Safe School Act. This is a concept I've worked on for years. It would be a $900 million grant program that would allow schools to harden and to have the technology that they need to keep children safe and to increase their physical security. And it would also allow schools to work with local law enforcement and train and hire former police officers to work as school security officers. So I'd like for you to talk for just a moment about the immediate need that we have to make certain that children are safe at school. Sure, well thank you for your question, Senator. First, I, I think it's important to acknowledge um, that statistically speaking, our, our schools are actually pretty safe places for children. It's, it's not, statistically speaking, where they are most likely to, to be shot. It's outside of school. That said, there's still a lot of work we can do. No child should have to go to school. No parent should have to send their child to school asking that question, is my child going to come home today? And that's a very real fear, um, even if statistically not the biggest part of the problem. Um, and so by by securing our schools, that's essentially what we're, we're trying to do. This is not some unique thought. This is Thanks. what we just walked into, all of us today, into this building um, with basic measures of, of security. Um, we know that in terms of uh, mass public shootings at schools, for example, the time that it takes for armed confrontation, the, the good guy with the gun to, to get there, mm -hmm. that is the difference between life and death for a lot of people. We saw okay, that Okay, let's talk a yep. little bit about those mass shooters because we know that 25% of the mass shooters have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder. And we know 55% of American adults with mental illness have never sought treatment and never received any treatment. 
And uh, we also know that 42% of mass shooters experienced physical abuse, sexual abuse, parental suicide, or severe bullying mm -hmm. as children. And Tennessee has a phenomenally successful program to address and alleviate childhood trauma that serves as a model for the nation. And Senator Shaheen and I have introduced a bill that would make those services available nationwide and the dollars to fund that. Dr. Rainey, it speaks a little bit to, to your work. But Ms. Schwer, if you will talk for a moment about the importance of addressing mental illness, I would appreciate that. And Mr. Cook, I'm going to come to you for the wrap up after her comment. Sorry, addressing untreated mental illness in, in particular, um, including early intervention, uh, getting people treatment before it becomes a crisis. This is important not just for suicide or for mass public shootings, so it certainly is important there. It's important for human flourishing. Um, it's important even uh, far beyond the scope of, of firearms. Again, we're talking about half of suicides, roughly half of suicides being with something other than a right. firearm. Um, and so to the extent that we can get people in crisis um, help, especially lethal means counseling um, about all lethal means, not just firearms, that saves lives. Um, and it, it also, again, promotes human flourishing. It promotes better right. communities and healthier families. And that is important on a grand Thank scale. Thank you. Mr. Cook, and welcome. Glad to see my fellow Tennessean here today. Pleased yeah. to be here. Thank you for having me. Sure. I'd like your response on the intervention and the mental health component of mass shootings and suicides. Well, if I could also touch on this, the school issue that you raised, sure. because part of the Project Safe Neighborhoods program that we had, and it was so successful in Knoxville, included interfacing with, as you may know, we had school resource I officers. And that was attacked nationally as part of the defund the police. It was an incredibly in important program as part of our comprehensive approach to reduce violent gun crime because those individuals brought a very positive influence into the schools. They made a good impression on the, on the children of all ages, mostly high schoolers in connection with our program, and proved to be a critical component in educating them on the need to, to avoid gun violence and the resources that are available to them in the community to avoid getting drawn into gang violence. Right, I appreciate that. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Senator Blackburn. I'm, I'm going to take a moment here, uh, a prerogative as chair of the committee, in light of testimony and questions earlier, uh, to note that the two of the three majority witnesses are from Chicago, which I'm honored to represent. I thank them for being here. And to also note that it is not uh, unusual for uh, my colleagues on the other side of the table to talk in term, negative terms about that city. I'm honored to represent it. It has many challenges, as most American cities do, uh, and I'm going to work to make things better. But a question was asked of Dr. Ranney about uh, Chicago, which she answered, and then proceeded uh, with a question from the senator from Louisiana uh, to talk about other areas facing challenges of gun violence that show uh, that they're struggling even more than Chicago. I'd like to give you an opportunity to complete that answer. Thank you. Um, I think I was talking about uh, Louisiana, New Mexico, uh, Utah, other states with quite high rates of gun deaths, and talking about the beautiful collaborations between community members, law enforcement, and the legislature in those states to both set up great data tracking and then to work with community groups to put in place programs to decrease gun deaths, both in the cities and in rural areas. Thank you for that, and I would say that any member of this panel who is naive enough to believe that his state, her state, will never be touched by gun violence should consider what's happened just recently in the state of Maine, where the, the whole population of the state was asked to stand down. Uh, no one would have chosen Maine as the next target for gun violence, but the fact is with 400 million guns in this country, every state, every city, every locality has that threat facing them. Senator Booker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a difficult issue for me because I live in uh, Newark, New Jersey. I'm the only uh, senator that lives in a, a urban community that is, uh, I live in a community below the poverty line and 
Uh, I see, I've had experiences with gun violence that is, uh, will chill me for the rest of my life. But one of the things that frustrates me is often the racial tinge that this has, that we often talk about this as an urban problem. It actually infuriates me because I think it makes it harder for us to come together and realize this is an American problem affecting all American communities. And, and just so, so we can be factual, from 2016 to 2020, 13 of the 20 counties with the most gun homicides per capita were rural communities. It is very frustrating that the talk about Chicago that I've heard so demonizes a city that actually doesn't have the highest murders per capita of American cities or even in American counties. And it really obscures the strategies to do something about this. Now, what urban communities like mine have, which frustrates me, uh, and I think this was said by Ms. Uh, Swearer, and others is that there are a whole bunch of other attendant problems that are correlate, correlative of violence. High lead poisoning levels, high poverty levels, inadequate housing. I could go on and on and on of issues that I've heard people on the conservative side of the aisle, to the to the, uh, conservative side of the, of, of, of the country, to the, to the more progressive side, understand that we are not often getting at the root problems that really create environments where violence proliferates. And so I'm, I'm so happy to have this conversation, but I've had decades of frustration living in my community and seeing evidence-based examples of things that lower violence. Mr. Cook, I wish you and I got to work together when I was a mayor to have you as a prosecutor in my city. I think you and I would have done a lot of good in, in all sincerity because what frustrates the hell out of me is cities like mine have too much of the policing we don't need where I watch kids getting arrested for doing things that kids at Yale and Stanford did when I was there. Now they've got records. Now they can't get jobs because they were arrested on marijuana charges when we have had presidents and senators bragging about their pot usage. And what that does economically to a city is stunning when you have mass incarceration for low-level nonviolent drug crime. But I do know when we target the small percentage of people in my city who have records of violence, we've been able to have incredible results. That's why I think you and I, if I was mayor and you were my, my U.S. attorney, we could have done some good by targeting what the problem is. But then some, Mr. Cook, you said something else, which, which stunned me when I became mayor, was how we were able to drive down recidivism rates by having substantive programs that help people come home. First of all, just getting identification or housing and a job dropped, dropped recidivism rates, not to mention all the other things that we can do, but we can't find funding for those programs to expand them to scale. Mr. Bryant, if you can just please, like we know violence intervention programs work. It's not even any more like, there's no debate here. Could you just tell me that the funding issue, if we were able to take programs like this to scale, what kind of results do you think we could see? Thank you for the question. I think we could see major results. Uh, we have do something in Chicago where we identify, you know, our population in each community, you know, all 77 neighborhoods uh, in those, you know, top 30 neighborhoods. We're looking at who are the identified people, what do we have currently in terms of funding, and what funding would be necessary for us to get to 75% of the people who are at risk of being a perpetrator or a victim of gun violence. And we're doing all of the things that everyone has said here. We're putting social supports around them. We're subsidizing people getting a GED. We're giving people transitional jobs, supporting them through jobs, paying for their, them to get to and from school to their job um, without having to pay for it. Um, so we all agree on the things that matter most. And I think the other, you know, the, some people would say that intact families are important. Well, we got to have intact families that are healthy mentally, financially, and are well housed as well to be an intact family. And let's just be clear. This is something I don't think most Americans know. Rural area, urban area, that the cost of a shooting I went to my hospital, University Hospital in Newark, and just said, how much does a non-fatal gunshot wound cost taxpayers? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Not to mention what that trauma does to a family or community. I've seen businesses close just because they've had shootings at them. The, the ripple effect of one shooting economically, yet we can't come up with the investments in evidence-based programs that are actually working to lower violence. We're being penny-wise and pounds and pounds foolish in this country. And there's enough bipartisan opportunity here in, in, this, in, this, in, this, in this room. We have shown that we can do bipartisan things on actual stuff that works to lower violence, but communities that are, that are so suffering from the trauma is incredible. If I can just have uh, for Mr. Whitehouse uh, one last uh, degree of, uh, of indulgence on a personal it's, level. Uh, Senator Lee, who is entitled to the indulgence here since he's up. No, I, I appreciate time. that. Well, this is actually about Senator Lee. It's very personal because uh, as much as he's my friend, he doubts me. And so, uh, Mr. Uh, Bryant, you're on, you're on under oath here. <laughs> you and I played uh, football together. You were on the wrong side of the ball. Just for Mr. Lee's benefit, am I a former great tight end or the greatest tight end you've ever played with? <laughs> uh, please, for my colleague, just let uh, him know. Yeah, yeah the, I guess at Stanford, yeah, I think on our particular team, he would have been the greatest on our team. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. That's for the record forever in the American congressional record. <laughs> And Take I stand, that, Senator Lee. Yeah, I stand corrected now. I'm never going to doubt you again. Thank you very I mean, much. After that, we've been arguing about this for years. So thanks for putting that to rest, Mr. Bryant. Uh, Ms. Ware, I'd like to start with you. Tell us a little bit about how many people in the United States every year are uh, using, how many times each year does an American use a firearm in self-defense? Um, so we don't have an exact number, uh, but when you look at sort of the, the conglomerate of studies, uh, they mostly find that with a couple very limited exceptions that are outliers, somewhere between 500,000 to several million times a year. Um, and I would note that the most extensive study on this issue, the 2021 National Firearms Survey, uh, further validated some of those earlier studies and came to a conclusion of about 1.6 million. Uh, and again, that was the most extensive survey ever conducted of firearms owners. Okay. What would that tell us about risks associated with putting legal restrictions on the books to the extent that those legal restrictions might impair the uh, ability of the law-abiding to use those for lawful purposes, given that it's normally law-abiding people who are most likely to comply with a new law? Um, what would that do to those people? Well, so it, it shows us generally that it's all about understanding where the risk is. For your ordinary law-abiding peaceable citizen who is mentally stable and, and not experiencing extreme stressors, um, which is, you know, most American gun owners at, at any given point, right? Their biggest benefit is that they can now protect themselves against their biggest, most substantial threat, which is external crime. Um, but I, I think most people on this panel would agree when you flip that, there are cases, right, where if you are now mentally unstable, if you are experiencing crisis, um, you statistically might be the bigger threat to yourself or if you are the one perpetuating crime, right? Well, now you are statistically the, the threat that needs to be solved. So it's about understanding where that threat is. And again, for your ordinary law-abiding gun owner, that threat is external, it's not internal. And that ability to possess that firearm is actually a net benefit to them. Again, assuming that they are not you know, leaving guns under their couch cushion for their six-year-old to find and, and, and that sort of thing, that can be problematic. But in the net, yes, it's a, it's a positive for them. Uh, and that's, that's helpful. And that's helpful to a point that uh, one of my colleagues made earlier in the hearing, which is that, um, you know, I, th I think we all want to get to a similar place insofar as we're focused on wanting to protect human life. Uh, we want fewer deaths and uh, it, dangerous things can happen if we assume that um, when we pass a law, it's going to affect, it's going to be a, a, a net life savings when that's not, not necessarily always the case. So when you had the governor of New Mexico issue a, a public health emergency uh, declaration and put in place this executive order dramatically restricting uh, the ability of law-abiding persons to um, uh, possess firearms uh, in certain places. Uh, that's significant. Now, when you look at the New Mexico case in particular, you, you've researched that and you found some fascinating information. Is it true that you discovered that in New Mexico only 0.002% of concealed carry permit holders in New Mexico had their permits revoked for any reason? So I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but that sounds 
correct. Um, and it is generally the case when you look at permit revocations uh, in, in any state, um, they are minuscule. Um, and that's again for, for any violation. That doesn't necessarily mean they that it was revoked because they used their weapon violently. Sometimes it can be, you know, they, they had a DUI or a, any sort of, you know, non-weapon related offense. But on the whole, when you look at those numbers, uh, concealed carry permit holders are amongst, if not the most law-abiding segment of the population. And yet uh, Governor Grisham's executive order would have affected them disproportionately. Meanwhile, you've got um, uh, new research that's been done and a lot of experts in the field from across the political spectrum and across the country have weighed in on this. Earlier this year, the chief of the DC Police Department uh, Chief Robert Conti said, quote, if we really want to see homicides go down, which I think we've established here, we want. We want to save lives. We really want to see homicides go down. Keep bad guys with guns in jail. He went on to say, quote, right now, the average homicide suspect has been arrested 11 times prior to them committing a homicide. In 2021, there was a study commissioned by the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform that found gun violence in D.C. to be tightly concentrated on, um, uh, on, a, on a very small number of high-risk individuals. In fact, they estimate that uh, within a year, there are 500 identifiable people considered to be very high risk. And these very high risk individuals comprise 60 to 70% of all gun violence in the district. So there again, we have the problem. If what we focus on is rules uh, that are going to be new rules, separate and apart from the uh, dozens of laws that have normally been broken, the minute someone commits a gun crime, the minute someone kills another human being with a gun, if by adding another gun law, a gun law of much wider applicability, and if what we're doing is restricting and restraining the rights of the law abiding, and hence their ability to defend themselves, will that necessarily save lives? Uh, no, Senator, and that's actually one of the things that I'm talking about in my testimony when I referenced um, you know, th th this idea of a lot of our commonly proposed gun control laws. They're not actually designed to get at any of the underlying factors. Um, so if you just tag on another law, w whatever it is, okay, now it's a universal background check or a magazine capacity restriction. Um, the people who were already illegally possessing those firearms to commit illegal crimes are not going to suddenly say, oh, it's what's triply illegal, so now I won't do it. Um, all you're doing is, is sort of expanding the likelihood that an otherwise ordinary peaceable citizen is going to get caught up in sort of a, a tic-tac uh, offense or even worse, um, it could actually undermine their ability to defend themselves in the most acute sort of self-defense scenarios. And of the 250,000 gun criminals incarcerated, uh, surveyed, uh, only 1% of them bought them from a retail, retail source. The rest of them bought them uh, through some underground uh, illegal avenue or on the street or something like that. So we gotta be very careful. Let's not punish the law abiding and thereby restrict their ability to protect themselves. That will cost lives, not save them. I uh, told Senator Tillis that he could have my spot because I was gonna be here for a while while Chairman Durbin was off and voting, so I'll recognize Senator Tillis and I'll take the next Democratic spot that lines up. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you all for being here. I, along with Senator Cornyn, joined with uh, Senator Sinema and uh, Senator Murphy to negotiate the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Stand by it. I think it's policy that's going to age well. Just uh, for an update, full implementation was January of last year. There have been six, 168,971 purchase transactions for under 21 since then. Um, 1,200 were denied, uh, not based on the Safer Communities Act, but based on a prior policy. 428 were denied based on the Safer Communities Act. Um, so to the Second Amendment advocates who said this was gonna to lead to a mass confiscation, they're patently wrong. More importantly, if they see the basis for the 400 or so that were rejected under the Safer Communities Act, no reasonable person would think that that was their day to buy a gun. So I would really encourage people to take a look at this bill, but not just look at the gun safety or, or the, the uh, 
the next processing. Take a look at school hardening. Take a look at investment in mental health. Take a look at a generational opportunity to address what I believe is the root cause uh, behind many of these mass shootings, and, and quite honestly, many of the deaths related to uh, to guns. Take a look at the number of suicides that are committed to, through a gun that was legally purchased. Uh, it's a behavioral health challenge that we need to look at. Uh, I supported the bipartisan effort uh, because I thought the policy was gonna good, be good policy and age well. What I don't like are people that are making it harder to get people back to the table and get something done. And you don't get anything done on gun violence around here without bipartisan cooperation, which is why I was very frustrated with President Biden on the day that he signed the Safer Communities Act. One of the reasons I didn't go to that signing is I fully expected he was gonna use it to spike the football and talk about more that he needs to get done that he knows damn well doesn't have bipartisan support. That is at the expense of where areas where we can work together. Similarly, Governor Grisham, you wanna push us further back from coming up with reasonable policy? pass or, or implement an executive order that's patently unconstitutional. That takes people away from the table, doesn't solve the problem. Now let's talk about gun, or let's talk about violence in our, in our uh, communities. Um, and I won't have time, but I would like, actually I would like to go back and ask states, conservative and liberal states, help us help your communities. Get right with providing information to the next processors so that they have the best available information about the backgrounds of these. If you're a Second Amendment advocate, you should be providing information to the next processing center so those under 21s can get their guns sooner. If you're a gun control av advocate, you should, and incidentally, Senator Booker, New Jersey's among one of the worst defenders of providing background information that we need to actually process um, and, and identify people who are at risk. It has to do with behavioral health adjudications and uh, criminal juvenile criminal arrest records. We've got to get this implementation right. But we've also got to look at the mental health and other components on the bill. I, I promised myself I wasn't gonna take most of my time on it, but here I go. It's an important bill, people need to understand it. Instead of looking past it to the next thing we should do here, which is oftentimes dividing us, every single senator should understand that bill and do what I do is have meeting after meeting after meeting in our state to make North Carolina the best implementation of the Safer Communities Act and hopefully other states will follow. Now I gotta get to the broken window theory. I believe that we're going through it. I, I believe I'm living it at Eastern Market. Uh, I bought a condo there about five years ago, felt good for about three years. Now I promised my wife after Votorama or when we get out of here at midnight, I will not walk home. It's a 15 minute walk that now feels different. And it's because local mayors and, and town councils have lost sight of the fact that I believe the broken window theory is real. And I believe where we proved it, uh, uh, that someone who's up for nomination in Baltimore, Baltimore, former Baltimore mayor, over 50% African-American population elected a white mayor in the form of Martin O'Malley because they were fed up with what they were experiencing in Baltimore. And by stepping up, he reduced crime, and you could, you could debate the number, but by about 30% as much as 42%. And it wasn't because he was letting people get a pass on jaywalking or anything else. He was holding people responsible and drawing the margins around what was acceptable behavior. Mr. Cook, do you believe in the, the broken window theory? Ms. Shear, I swear to you. I'll get that if you want me to. <laughs> I, I believe it is one of a number of theories that is helpful to understanding crime. Um, I, I firmly believe that the resurgence of crime that we're seeing, the feeling that I have now in Washington, D.C., has more to do with people uh, mixing up uh, Dr. Cozy Gay. I believe that people uh, deserve forgiveness. You are a lot further along in your faith journey than I am in forgiving mass murderers and a number of other people, but good on you for being there. But hopefully we can both agree that these, these mass murderers need to redeem themselves while they spend the rest of their lives in prison when we're talking about those sorts of offenses. Um, but until we start recognizing that this, our communities are less safe, governor's orders taking away guns like New Mexico are forcing more people to buy guns. Gun ownership is at an all time high now and it's gonna get higher if you keep doing this kind of crap, governor from New Mexico. We need people to sit around the table and act like adults, 
go back and have unpleasant conversations with people that are in our parties, but get to the table and solve problems. And we're not gonna do it by talking about take all the guns away or give them all guns. And we're not gonna do it by making any of this reduction, increase in crime and reduction in safety in these communities excusable. Whether it's Chicago, Charlotte, New York, Portland, doesn't matter. We all know what safe feels like, and you can't tell me you can walk the streets of San Francisco at night now and feel safe. Local elected, state electeds, everybody else need to recognize they, they have a responsibility to the people of those communities to make them safer, and they are going in the wrong direction now. And gun violence is only one piece of the puzzle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are at yet another hearing called by Democrats on gun control. Understand that today's Democrats in the Senate, these are not your father's Democrats. There are no moderate Democrats left in Congress. Today's Democrats, when it comes to guns, their objective is to disarm law-abiding citizens. They simultaneously embrace policies that release violent criminals from jail. They're not interested in locking up murderers. They're not interested in locking up gang bangers. They're not interested in locking up violent criminals. Instead, they systematically support policies that release violent criminals. By the way, if you, if you are hesitant to believe me when I say this, perhaps you'll believe the mayor of Dallas, the mayor of Dallas, Eric Johnson, who's a friend, He's a lifelong Democrat. He's an African-American mayor, elected in Dallas, been a Democrat his whole life until just recently. He left the Democrat Party and became a Republican. Now, let me read you why Mayor Johnson became a Republican. Quote, unfortunately, many of our cities are in disarray. Mayors and other local elected officials have failed to make public safety a priority or to exercise fiscal restraint. Most of these local leaders are proud Democrats who view cities as laboratories for liberalism rather than as havens for opportunity and free enterprise. Too often, local tax dollars are spent on policies that exacerbate homelessness, coddle criminals, and make it harder for ordinary people to make a living. And too many local Democrats insist on virtue signaling proposing half-baked government programs that aim to solve every single societal ill and on finding new ways to thumb their noses at, at Republicans at the state and federal level. It, it's, I have to say to an ordinary person, the political ideology of today's Democrats makes no sense. Why? Your priority is disarming a law-abiding citizen, but not going after the violent criminal. And, and to be clear, it is the radical left that advocates abolishing the police and defunding the police. And when I say there are no moderate Democrats left, the Biden administration has nominated not one, not two, but three of the leading advocates of abolishing the police to senior positions at the, at the US Department of Justice. Every single Democrat on this committee voted to confirm every single one of them, but not just on this committee. Every single Democrat in the United States Senate voted to, co to confirm all three of the Biden nominees, including Rachel Rollins, nominated by the U.S. Attorney in Massachusetts, one of the leading advocates of abolishing the police as a local prosecutor. She put out a list of violent crimes that she wouldn't prosecute. You know what, we're not having a hearing on the impact of Soros prosecutors releasing violent criminals from jail. We're not having a hearing on carjacking in Washington, D.C. because the Democrat City Council lowered the penalty for carjacking, lowered the penalty for murder. We're not having a hearing on Congressman Henry Cuellar, a Democrat from Texas who was carjacked in Washington, D.C. at 9.30 at night. We're also not having a hearing on the Antifa and Black Lives Matter riots across the country because to Democrats, when stores are being looted, when, fire, when police cars are being firebombed, when police officers are being murdered, that's not a crisis if they agree with the ideology of the criminals. Instead, their objective is they wanna take away 
the firearm from the single mom who's taking the subway home at night, who that is the only prevention she has against the violent criminals that the Democrats are unleashing. And by the way, to give you an, a, a, an underscoring of it, look, we have a mental health crisis in this country. I've repeatedly introduced legislation to improve school safety, to invest to double the number of police officers in schools. Democrats objected. To invest $15 billion in mental health counselors in schools. Democrats objected. Their priority is not stopping the criminals. Their priority is disarming law-abiding citizens. And by the way, they call it a public health crisis because they want to put supposed experts in charge of disarming you. The Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights is not a public health crisis. What is a public health crisis is the crime rates that are skyrocketing because Democrats keep letting murderers and violent criminals out of jail. But Dr. Rainey, let me ask you a question in terms of public health. Right now today, what's the leading cause of death for Americans age 18 to 45? I believe that it's opioids. Uh, it is, it is drug overdoses. Last year, more than 100,000 Americans died of drug overdoses. 70% of that came from Chinese fentanyl that is flooding across our southern border because this administration has opened up our southern border to 8.6 million illegal immigrants, has enriched the drug traffickers. Do you think, Dr. Rainey, that fentanyl flooding across our open border on the south that has killed collectively 100,000 overdoses last year, do you think that's a public health crisis? Absolutely, synthetic fentanyl is a major crisis and Senator Reed from my home state of Rhode Island has been a leader in trying to stop the supply of synthetic Except fentanyl. Except he hasn't States. because Senator Reed, along with every other Democrat supports Joe Biden's <laughs> open borders because when we try to secure the borders, they block it over and over and over again. And the criminals who come across who are taking people's lives, that is because the Democrats refuse to enforce and the law. Senator Cruz, equally important is harm reduction to ensure that those who use opioids have access to things like Suboxone or buprenorphine and methadone to help so that they don't use illicit substances off the street. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks very much. Let me uh, <clears throat> welcome Dr. Rani back here and thank her for all of her good work in Rhode Island. Um, Dr. Randy, did you have occasion in the emergency rooms of Rhode Island to treat gunshot patients? I did. And did you uh, have occasion to um, observe the difference between gunshot injuries from what you might call regular ammunition versus gunshot injuries from essentially weapons of war where the projectile, the bullet, travels at particularly high speed so, uh, as it hits the human body. It's difficult to know in the emergency department what type of ammunition is used. I've, we have seen an increasing number of patients with multiple gunshot wounds at once, um, which is obviously much more difficult to save. What are the... Um, What is the experience like of um, the ambulance pulling up into the bay and somebody coming into your hands with uh, gunshot wounds, particularly multiple gunshot wounds, and perhaps if you can identify it, even high-speed projectile AR-15 type gunshot wounds? So when we get an alert from EMS that they're coming in with a gunshot wound, which we often but not always do, uh, we mobilize not just emergency physicians, um, but also trauma surgeons, social workers, medical students, respiratory therapists, and so on. So there's radiology techs. There's somewhere between 15 and 20 folks who go into a room. We mobilize blood supplies um, in order to have that at the ready. Um, bring a lot of different equipment ranging from chest tubes to um, the tools that we use to crack a chest if needed um, and have these standard algorithms that we follow as we take care of a patient. Uh, sometimes those are successful. Um, often they are not. Uh, the likelihood of saving someone's life depends on both where they are shot and how many times they are shot. 
Um, I have seen, again, although I cannot identify types of ammunition or types of firearms in the emergency department, that's not my training, and we don't know that at the time, um, I have seen uh, organs shredded, um, aortas bisected, um, and obviously have, have seen folks um, with uh, gunshots to the brain um, as well. Uh, suffice it to say that um, knife wounds and beating injuries are customarily easier to treat than uh, gunshot wounds, and particularly multiple gunshot wounds? That is correct. Um, I'll also say that uh, another senator made a point about suicide. Um, most suicide attempts we can also save. Um, suicide attempts by a firearm are almost universally lethal. And um, not to belabor the point too much, but have you ever witnessed multiple injuries by musket, which was the uh, firearm of choice uh, at the time the Second Amendment was drafted. I don't know that I've ever seen a musket wound. Yeah. And I think um, the founders may well have had enough common sense to understand that in the time it takes to reload a musket, um, if somebody were going berserk in a tavern, uh, or at a musical performance, there'd be plenty of time to intervene. And that something categorically different takes place when an individual has access to weapons that either are or can be configured to fire rapid fire and to fire ammunition of an entirely different and more destructive nature because of the speed with which the projectile flies. So thank you for being here. So sorry we lost you to our uh, Connecticut neighbors, um, but thank you for your service in Rhode Island, and I'm glad you still tell everybody that you're a Rhode Islander. Still my, still my home address, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Well, I'd like to say a word to particularly those at the witness table, but especially those with white coats. Now you've seen it. You've seen the debate in the American political scene over something from your perspective that seems so obvious. I would imagine if your professional responsibilities take you into a surgery or a treatment room for a gunshot victim, that after it's over, when you finally get a chance to relax for a moment with a colleague, you think, what are those politicians thinking? Why don't they take a look at what we're seeing every single day in virtually every hospital across America? And why don't they do something? Well, there are two or three different approaches, as you've probably noted and listened to the senators ask their questions. I can recall one approach. I was a member of the House. It was almost 30 years ago. It's a long time. 30 years ago, and along came a new narcotic called crack cocaine. It scared the hell out of us. It was a form of cocaine, but it was a form that was dirt cheap, highly addictive, and devastating to pregnant women carrying babies. We decided to do something. We passed the drug bill. What we did was this. We got tough. I mean really tough. We increased the penalty for crack cocaine over powder cocaine by 100 to 1. 100 to 1. What you could hold in your hand could put you in prison for the rest of your life. And that was our answer to it, to finally put an end to it. Well, what happened? Exactly the opposite of what we expected. The price of crack cocaine on the street went down instead of up, and the use of crack cocaine in our country went up instead of down. Then we filled the federal prisons for almost 20 years, primarily with African-American defendants who were sentenced to long sentences, sometimes over 20 years, for that handful of crack cocaine. Ultimately, we came to our senses, at least partially several years ago, and reduced it from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. Now let me add, from a pharmacological viewpoint, there is literally no difference of the impact of crack cocaine on your system over powdered cocaine. But we were getting tough, really tough. Finally, under President Donald Trump, I mean that, under President Donald Trump, he signed a bipartisan bill that Senator Grassley and I co-sponsored called the First Step Act, which basically said we're gonna take away the mandatory minimum aspects of some of these uh, provisions relating to narcotics. So this debate's been going on as long as I've been in Congress. We've learned and we've forgotten and we've learned again and forgotten again. 
and that's what we face today. To think that people don't recognize what guns are doing to America, just is amazing to me. Uh, when that fellow got up on the roof of the business in Highland Park, Illinois, in 60 seconds he fired off 83 rounds, 83 rounds from a military assault weapon. Tell me that the average American needs a military assault weapon to protect themselves or their family. I don't buy it. I just don't buy it. Whatever my view of the Second Amendment, it didn't include anything even envisioned by our founding fathers that looked like an assault weapon. So the question is, will we do anything as a result of these hearings? Some of you as witnesses have expressed, expressed a weariness that we keep returning to this topic. It is intentional. It's not accidental. I'm coming back to this topic as long as it is a threat to America, and it's certainly a threat. My special guest from Chicago, thank you for coming. Thanks for what you do with your lives. You don't give up on people, and that really makes a difference. You're turning lives around. We've got to do more of it. So at this point, we've learned that hospital and community-based violence programs, violence prevention programs, partnerships with law-abiding gun owners and more, all steps that can prevent firearm injuries and deaths. It bears repeating that we're gonna to continue to tackle this topic because that is why we were sent here. That is the province and responsibility of the Senate Judiciary Committee. The hearing record is going to remain open for one week for submission of materials for the record. And with that, the Senate Judiciary Committee stands adjourned. Thank you.